So to dig deeper into the question of where new homeless shelters should be housed and why, we want to welcome three guests back to BK Live. First, our good friend Robert Carnegie Jr., city council member for Brooklyn's 36th district. Good to see you again. Good morning, Brian. All right, next is Michael Lambert. He's the executive director of the bed Gateway Business Improvement District. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. All right, and Camille is also here. She's a reporter who's been following this story on DNA Info New York. Camille Bautista, welcome back to BK Live. So first of all, there's someone missing from the table. Before we start with you guys, I want to let you know we kind of exhaustively have been in touch with the folks at the Department of Homeless Services. It's an agency that's about 2,000 strong that works with a budget of about $1 billion, but they couldn't find any of those 2,000 who appear on BK Live today or take any of that important time that they devote to helping the homeless in New York by even writing us a statement. So if you're out there in DHS and you happen to see this video, Video, why not send over a statement or better yet a representative so we can speak to these issues but I'm happy that you guys are here I want to start with you uh, and say if we can't talk to DHS and they can't have someone here what kind of contact does a New York City Council member who has a high concentration of homeless shelters and homeless people in his district have with the folks at DHS so ironically enough uh, my contact with DHS has been minimal, but Steve Banks, mm -hmm. who is the commissioner for HRA, but now oversees DHS, right. um, I spoke to prior to coming today. Um, <laughs> there's a tremendous communication gap, as yeah. you've already detailed, obviously between the community and its accessibility to DHS personnel, yeah. as it relates to just anything um, in terms of uh, what shelters, are, w what sites mm -hmm. are being slated for shelters. Um, oftentimes, we get the information um, after, yeah. uh, in the instance of a, a hotel on Atlantic Avenue, which is in the, con in the confines of the 36th Council District, That's right. we were informed by the community mm -hmm. that it was being used and had been shifted from its intention, its initial intention to uh, uh, temporary housing for the homeless afterwards. So we, we have had, in the past, some difficulty. Uh, Commissioner Banks has assured me that going forward that won't be the case. So we talked about uh, in our intro here the number of sort of black and brown people who make up New York City's homeless population. So I'm just going to put it out there for everyone. Why is homelessness such a black and brown problem in the New York City context? I mean, well, I'll take that. So I think that one thing is that it all boils back to socioeconomic conditions. And I think traditionally, um, people of color tend to be lower on the economic spectrum and in many cases tend to uh, have more um, stressors mm -hmm. related to things that actually eventually lead to things like loss of jobs, loss of income, uh, inability to actually afford a stable living situation. And that then contributes, I think, to some of what you see reflected in the homeless issues that you see in New York City. So and, and there's that ugly G word uh, that we hate mentioning. Um, there's a the negative aspects of gentrification that um, kind of expedite mm -hmm. uh, homelessness in communities like Bedford-Stuyvesant and Crown Heights yeah. um, uh, have been exacerbated by the, the onset of gentrification. So Camille, we know that you're all over the city working and filing stuff for DNA Info. Why isn't this a story in the case of this bed location about nimbyism? How is this different from every other community, maybe notably in Queens, where there's been a lot of uh, ruckus about a hotel being turned into a family shelter? What separates this from other locations? Right. Like you mentioned, we're seeing this all across the city. I mean, most notably Maspeth right now. People are talking about that. Williamsburg, Bushwick. Mm -hmm. um, neighbors are pushing back against a hostel that's being turned right. into a, a homeless into the shelter. Right. Um, but in this case, um, people are really stressing that it's not an issue of not in my backyard, but more so a fair share issue. Um, residents in Bed-Stuy um, and in Central Brooklyn are saying that they have, you know, contributed to this burden. Um, there are 13 shelters alone, DHS says, mm -hmm. in Bed-Stuy, whereas you're seeing some other areas of the city that have none. So it's more about um, we have done, you know, our part in helping the homeless, but don't put it all, you know, on our plate is what residents have said. 
So that's what residents are saying. What's the business community saying about the potential impact of yet another homeless uh, facility in the confines of the neighborhood? So if you go down to uh, Bedford Atlantic, you have uh, a large armory, which is actually one of the largest single adult male shelters in the city right now. Right. And so some of the businesses actually have um, seen some vestiges of the impact of having that sh shelter so close to the business district. Um, I think that by adding another shelter, which is actually about maybe two blocks away, proposed um, drop-in site, which would be about two blocks away from the existing shelter, yeah. it's going to perpetuate, uh, I think, more, from what the business is saying, more uh, quality of life conditions. So mm -hmm. sometimes, unfortunately, some of our homeless individuals, uh, their behavior is not basically savory. Yeah. You know, we've had um, questions in terms of when people have identified themselves as being homeless of, you know, sometimes public urination, mm -hmm. sleeping on benches, things that basically don't contribute to moving a business district and a business corridor in the right direction. So, okay, devil's advocate for a moment. If there's a homeless shelter two blocks down the street, then what's the difference? We're just going to put another one in. It's just adding a little bit more capacity to this neighborhood. Why is that not a view that folks in the community take? So I don't think that that's not a view that folks in the community take. I think that, um, again, it's about equity and, f and fair share and parity okay. across the board. And I think that we have been and continue to remain one of the most empathetic communities as it relates to homelessness, because we are probably disproportionately mm -hmm. uh, most, most affected by it with gentrification. Um, my recommendation has been and still remains that out of the um, Camille uh, detail 13, in my estimation, and in my statistics, is 14 shelters. Really? But uh, because I believe that there's a operator, there's two operators in one building somewhere, so it's, it's, it's really 14. Yeah. What I'm saying is, hey, we're not saying not in my backyard, we're not saying that we don't want to do this, but out of the 14 shelters, you could facilitate a drop-in shelter. For example, you could actually use uh, what's been determined or classified as a working shelter. Mm -hmm. where those residents are required to be out at jobs or out at training, right. you could use that same facility to house a drop-in shelter and in the alternate hours actually function and operate as a drop-in center. So we're not even saying, no, get out of here, period. We're saying, hey, how about the 14 shelters that already exist? Mm -hmm. How about using and doubling one of those facilities to meet your needs? And the infrastructure for it's already there. So if it's a shower that you're, that you're um, concerned about, and cleanliness and sanitary conditions, you already have that available as prescribed by your mandate through DHS to operate that facility. So, so we're doubly saying, hey, we just don't need another one in another separate location. Right. Why don't we start to think smart and more efficiently? Because actually, um, from a fiduciary responsibility standpoint, you would cut back even on the cost if you operated it simultaneously in an already existing facility. Right. So <laughs> this is double not NIMBY, and this is us thinking ahead mm -hmm. and also as a community coming together to try to provide solutions. So whereas in other parts of the city, you mentioned before what's the, what's the, the, the differentiation between other parts of the city, we're saying, hey, we're willing to do right. what's necessary to house and to get our people on the right track, but you got you to gotta be responsible about doing it. Also, it hasn't been mentioned here, that is directly across the street from a public school. And, and we don't feel that that is appropriate, an appropriate use of space when right. we, the, you know, especially today when, I'm, it's highlighted today when you go out and you go around the district on the first day of school and you see these young right. uh, uh, students and scholars and parents who are eager and ready to get their students prepared to learn while simultaneously there's a consideration to put, yeah. You know, uh, when you're one of the city's legislators, is there any movement afoot to really look at the way that we allocate these funds? I said that they work with a billion dollar operating budget. And I think that it's pretty much proven that it's cheaper to keep someone in their house than to continue to house without families question, piecemeal. Brian, without question. And, that, and that's the important thing to look at. So while we move forward as a city, and try to address the homeless issues, we have to be responsible and we have to be fiscally responsible. That's part of the city council's responsibility. So we're saying that we know that it's uh, more cost effective yeah. to subsidize sustainable long-term housing with support than it is to temporarily house With 25,000 kids sleeping in a shelter. That, that is, that's a ridiculous number and the yeah. money being spent on shelters, whether it be building them from the ground up or whether it be converting uh, hotels, hotels yeah. it's incredibly expensive. 
and it's a temporary fix, yeah. and we just know that that doesn't work. It hasn't worked in past administrations, mm -hmm. and we know that it won't work now. So, Camille, you are at a lot of these meetings and community boards where communities, for the first time in a lot of instances, get to hear from uh, the department themselves and not just the neighborhood rumors or this is going here, this is going where. What's the temperature like in those meetings? You should definitely be there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a sight to be seen. But, um, you know, these are people who have been longtime residents or not even longtime residents who yeah. really care about their neighborhood and they're invested um, you know in their children and their resources and the businesses there and they just want um, like Councilman Carnegie mentioned you know equity they want their fair share they just want to um, be able to help these homeless people but also <coughs> help themselves in their community you know I think one thing that um, a resident had mentioned was uh, there is no homeless problem or there 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 isn't an identified homelessness problem mm -hmm. in the area but if you're bringing a, a so-called drop-in center or a shelter you're, so creating, you're creating a problem um, so this is something that residents are really concerned about and the back and forth kind of usually um, doesn't really go anywhere but yeah. it's important to have their voices heard and directly for agencies like DHS to hear it straight from the people. Okay, we have 45 seconds left. I'm going to ask the most unfair question now then. There are a bunch of folks moving into the neighborhood who haven't historically been there. We mentioned the G word. Does the fact that the neighborhood is becoming more racially diverse give any more weight to the complaints now? It's not just a bunch of people complaining about people who look like them coming in. I got the sense that one of the meetings, they're saying, these are homeless people from your community, so you should be housing them. But is the fact that it is becoming more eth economically and ethnically diverse give any more weight to the arguments that people are making against? I, I actually think, ironically enough, it does to some degree because you have diverse people with mm -hmm. different aspects coming together. Our meeting was the first time a lot of people in our community who are new, old, future, had coalesced around a particular issue. Right. And that's what I saw in the room. I saw people coming together saying, hey, and the, and the, and the new residents and our new neighbors yeah. weren't saying, hey, we don't want it. They were saying equity as well. They were saying, hey, we're aware right. that this exists, and we want to make sure that there are good quality programs available, because if not, potentially people will, you know, will, will kind of just um, have, have their run of the community. So it was people coming together saying, hey, we're willing to do our fair share. Let's be prudent about how we do it. Let's be fiscally sound how we spend the city's money. Mm -hmm. So that was the first time in a long time that those people had even been in the room together. So that actually, for me, means that we're, we're moving in the right direction as a community when we can coalesce around a common goal or a common issue. Oh, well, we'll continue to look at DNA Info to keep updated and hear from you. And uh, like you said, there's an open invitation to the folks at the Department of Homeless Services to find yourselves on BK Live. Thank you all for being here. We appreciate it.